So we're going to take you on um, a journey that we've gone through here in terms of for the Southwest Indiana Evansville region, uh, creating benchmarks against peers and then analyzing those trends and then um, setting goals and then finally um, building regional analytics to track strategies over time. So I'm going to start here with just a, an overview and then I'm going to hand it over to Pete. So. Um, Pete will first give you a background on the region. What does Evansville look like? What is <coughs> the region that it covers? What is his goal in this project? That's what are they trying to do? And why is it important to his region? And I think a lot of you are going to find this um, to be uh, critical to, to your regions and uh, a process that you could apply. And so then I'll come back um, and talk about what do we need to get there. So first, identifying peer regions. How did we do that? Then how do we track progress against those peers? Then um, how do we focus on key indicators and set goals? Uh, and then once we have those key indicators, what are the drivers of those key indicators? And then um, looking at best practices for reaching goals, and then finally developing and implementing regional strategies. And I think um, what we've seen Pete and his group do is something that is unusual in that oftentimes we end up giving someone all these key indicators and it sits on a shelf and the strategies never get put into place. But he was very quick to get his work streams together to get them on a schedule to um, create strategies for 2025. So with that, let me turn it over to Pete to tell you about the region. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get some interesting insights that you can take away from uh, this session and, and uh, hopefully apply it back to uh, where you're at. Um, as Chris mentioned, I have a bit of a, a non-traditional economic background, if you will. Um, I spent about 25 year, 25 plus years in the pharmaceutical industry as the head of um, marketing and public affairs. When I left that and thought I was retiring, I was sort of called back into action um, through the Evansville Regional Business Committee, which I'll talk to you uh, here in a minute. You might say, well, what is pharmaceutical marketing have anything to do with economic development? And there's probably not a lot, but what I do have a knack to be able to do is get people aligned and inspired behind a vision and move people along that path to getting to, to that vision. So I think my skill set in all of this is how do I bring or how, how do we bring um, key organizations together inspired under one vision, one mission, one, of, one objective, if you will, and, and do it in a timely, timely manner. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you'll see as is, is we go through this um, is that what's unusual, I think, about this initiative is it's being business-led versus government-led. Uh, and, and as I talk about who the ERBC is in a, here in a minute, I think you'll see w why that's the case. So just a little bit of background on, on myself. Uh, the Evansville Regional Business Committee, uh, ERBC, and let me sidetrack just for one second. For those of you who may follow college basketball, that is the same Evansville that just beat Kentucky in number one in college basketball last night. So cheers to Evansville. <coughs> so, uh, the Evansville Regional Business Committee is made up of some of the top business leaders uh, in, in the region. Uh, we have about 25 members on our board, and it is a, a pay-to-play, if you will. It's not a free board. You're, you're, um, you join the Evansville Regional Business Committee. Um, it's been around for about 15 years. I've been in this role for about four years now. Um, historically, they've been involved in some of the largest and more transformative type of projects in the Evansville region. Um, I think what I was brought in to do, and, and I think where I uh, play a role here is in the third bullet point, which is how do we facilitate clear, focused, and aligned strategies going forward? Uh, I'm not sure that's always been the case in southwest Indiana, where Evansville is located. Um, so I think that's a big piece of what I was brought in to do, is, is get the clarity, get the focus, and, and get the right strategies in place. A uh, little bit about Evansville and where we are. So we're in the southwest corner of Indiana. Um, we're, we're, as they say, two hours from everywhere. We're two hours from St. Louis, two hours from Nashville, two hours from Indianapolis, two hours from Louisville. So that kind of corners us there. Uh, we are a bi-state region. We're right on the Ohio River. 
And when we talk about our uh, MSAs, it includes Henderson, Kentucky. So Henderson is right across the river from, from us and where we are. So geographically, just let you see where we're located. Um, this is just a real quick snapshot of the downtown area. Um, Evansville is made up, the Evansville region is made up of five counties um, in southwest, well, four counties in southwest Indiana and one in Henderson, Kentucky, but that's our MSA. But just to give you a snapshot of downtown, obviously the Ohio River in the background, Henderson, Kentucky, just across the river, and uh, the downtown Evansville area, which is going through a fairly large redevelopment and, and revitalization process right now. Um, our, our size, is the, uh, the MSA is about 350,000. Uh, within the city of Evansville, it's about 130,000. Uh, we're not a consolidated city county government or city county operations. Um, largest employment sectors, uh, manufacturing is by far our largest, uh, followed by uh, healthcare. Um, and going across the top, those are the number of people that are employed in those sectors and the average salaries in those sectors as well. Again, just to give you a quick snapshot there. Uh, major employers, Barry Global is by far the, the largest in terms of financial. They're a $13 billion company with their headquarters uh, located in, uh, in Evansville. They make a lot of uh, um, plastic food grade and medical grade supplies. Um, plastic cups, uh, surgical uh, equipment, surgical gear, and so on and so forth. They are, they have their world headquarters in, in Evansville. Um, there's also a very large manufacturing workforce. Toyota has a very large automo automotive plant uh, in, in the Evansville area, along with Mead Johnson Nutrition, which is a pharma company, AstraZeneca as well, along with very large and very fast growing healthcare systems being Deaconess, uh, one of them, and St. Vincent Hospital being the other. Again, just to give you a, a flavor of, of um, the region and some of the, uh, some of the players. All of these uh, individual companies are represented on our, on our board as well. Okay, so why is it important and what's our goal behind what we're trying to do here? Um, you know, I think when I took over this role uh, as the president of ERBC, um, I sense there is a lot of things happening across the region, and some of them really pretty good things, but they were all happening very independently. Uh, we sort of coined the term, we were, um, we were a region full of tactics in search of a strategy. We had a lot of tactics, but none of them really linked, very independent. This one didn't know what that one was doing and didn't really understand the interrelationships between, uh, between those. So a lot of good things happening, but they were happening very independently across the region without a lot of tie-in. Um, so very quickly, as ERBC, we realized, you know, we really need a system or a systematic process to begin to accelerate our growth and development of the region. And that's where Talent 25 uh, was, was birthed, if you will. Um, we formed a core team behind Talent 2025, and if I will, I think this is an important uh, point. I'll spend a few minutes talking about that. The core team, obviously, is being led by the ERBC uh, group. We have three organizations that are very much economic development uh, oriented. The Chamber of Commerce, the Economic Development Coalition of Southwest Indiana, and a group called the Growth Alliance for Greater Evansville. The Growth Alliance represents the largest county in those five counties that I, that I mentioned. That's the core, it includes the core downtown area of Evansville going forward. So typical economic development organizations represented by those three. Um, I, I think Gray mentioned in his previous, for those of you who sat through Gray's discussion uh, right before lunch, uh, he mentioned the importance of having um, a, uh, uh, religious organization involved. Um, Welburn Baptist Foundation represents that religious organization. They are um, uh, an endowment, uh, a not-for-profit that's been around for probably 15 years or more, um, a huge endowment, but they also play very much in the space of um, youth uh, education, youth development, and uh, health. Um, the, 
they're, they're very active in trying to improve the overall health of the region. I don't mean financial health, I mean physical health. Looking at obesity, smoking, um, diabetes, and so on. Uh, what, what can be done, and I think you'll see some of the data here, and, and it, it, it makes a lot of sense on why, why they're involved as we get going. Um, and then finally, the United Way of, of Southwest Indiana. So those are the core organizations that are at the heart of Talent 2025 and what we're doing. Um, get a little bit out of sequence here, but as we collected the data early on in the process, before we actually had the core team, it was just the ERBC. I was working with Chris and her team to collect data to try to understand where the areas are that we really need to lean into and develop a sound strategy against. That led us to organizations like the Wellborn Baptist Foundation and the United Way, because as you're going to see, uh, the overall health of the region needs a lot of work. Um, and the other piece that needs a lot of work in our region is poverty levels. And the United well Way was, was interested, willing um, to roll up their sleeves and say, we would like to own poverty in this region and try to address the issue of poverty in this region. So that led us to forming the core team that you see here. Um, the goal is really threefold, and, and I mentioned this um, already in, in passing. We really started off by collecting data and performance indicators that Chris is going to walk you through how we did that and how we got to where we're going to be. From those performance indicators or that data, we really then set goals, and I'm going to show those goals to you as we, as we go through this presentation. What goals do we have that can lead to a very focused investment uh, opportunity here? Uh, and then thirdly, how do we get aligned uh, with the public and private sector behind those goals and indicators? Um, this is work in progress for us right now. So at the end of this session, you're not going to see what our key strategies are. What you're going to see is how we collected the data, how we use that data to form our process, what that process looks like, and, and then maybe next year we come back and we can update you on where those strategies landed, what they look like, and what does the implementation begin to look like. So um, those are sort of the three steps that we took to getting us to the point where, uh, to where we are right now. Okay, with that, Chris, I'm going to hand it back to you, and Chris is going to take you through the er some of the early days here as we were collecting the data, determining what we needed to collect, and, and one of the things we wanted to do as well is we wanted to benchmark our region against peer and aspirational cities. So we spent quite a bit of time um, researching who those peers and who those aspirationals uh, should be. Um, that Chris is going to walk you through that process. Mm -hmm. All right, and we might tag team this yes, in and out sure. as well. So. All right, thanks, Pete. I won't drift too far yeah. away. And by the way, if any of you have questions, please go ahead and raise your hand, and we can take them as we're going along. And something else I should have told you that some of you may not know since you're Jobs EQ users, we have a consulting side of the business. And in our consulting side, we work with Pete and Evansville on this project. But you'll see we also use Jobs EQ data in this. So identifying peer regions. So um, really two things um, at the top there. We had data for choosing the peer region, and in some places that was different than the data for choosing the economic indicators. The peer regions are a point in time the economic indicators were tracking over time. So um, for the peer regions, um, the um, data, some of them don't change over time. Some have changed very slowly, um, and we want to pick regions that are similar. So, for example, uh, we don't want to choose another capital. That's not going to ever change. Evansville is never going to be a capital, we don't think, of the state. So um, another thing, we don't want to choose areas that are on the ocean because Evansville is not uh, on the ocean, or a college town. So we excluded all regions that were college towns. And I'll go into all the data we looked at in a minute. So that was in terms of the who are our peers. And then once we chose the peers, we came up with economic indicators, and they're used to track um, progress over time, identifying underlying reasons why we're not um, growing like our peers are, and to frame the strategy or to start to frame the strategy so that they could look at the drivers and figure out, well, how can we reduce poverty or how can we increase employment faster? And then one of the important things 
was that we needed the data to be national, that is available for every county, because we wanted a, a apple and apple comparison, and they had to be from credible sources. So in working with um, Pete and his committee, they want to increase the youth population, so they said, let's measure the number of bars in the area. Well, there is no data set that gives us the number of bars and restaurants. We can look at the, percent, the em employment in that type of industry, but um, that may very, it may be hard to track down, and so we gave up on that one. Another one was um, bicycle trails. How many miles of bicycle trails are in all of these regions by county? And there's a rail to trail association that tracks that, but not for every county in the US. So again, we were limited by what we could get for every county, um, and it had to be from a credible source. Some other ones we looked into were FBI um, um, overdoses, and that seemed like a good one from the health side, but then as we read more about it, uh, those, the numbers were only as good as the sheriff's offices um, provided, so we gave up on that one. So some of the potential metrics, we have five groupings here. From the demographic side, of course, population, density. We started out with millennium population because everyone's tracking that, but then we said, well, you know, when we go over time, the millennials will no longer be the youngest population, so instead we went with um, a young age group that we would be tracking over time. Um, other things, poverty, ethnicity, uh, number of children in a single household. On the economic side, unemployment rate, uh, manufacturing percentage or the overall index, and that's very important. I'll talk about that in a minute. The number of Fortune 500 headquarters, that one was a lab labor-intensive one to find out, so we had to go to some sources and just pretty much count who was a Fortune 500 and where were they headquartered. Infrastructure, airport employments, uh, whether or not there was a military base there, public transit, um, high school graduation, total rail miles, we uh, looked at that at first, and then we dropped it because total rail miles are what that is. It doesn't give us total rail miles in use. And Evansville has a lot of total rail miles, many of them not being used, so that would give us a false indicator. Uh, quality of place, uh, the cost of living, natural amenities. There is a site where you can find how many museums are in each county, so we did look at that. Colleges and universities, sporting teams, um, access to parks, and then on the policy side, we looked at state tax burden and right to work status, but then ultimately did not use the policy indicators at all in the final indicators that we came up with. So here's an example of just the overall industry mix and why that's important. So Evansville is in blue, orange is a peer region, uh, one of the peer regions, and on the left-hand side, you can see all of the um, major sectors, and this is in terms of employment. What's the percent of employment in each, each uh, grouping? And then on the right-hand side, we're looking at the difference between the two. And so for the most part, it may be one, two, or three percent, not three percent difference between Evansville and the peer with regard to the industry mix, and then a total of up to, uh, if you sum those all up, 11 percent. So this was a good candidate, candidate to us in terms of a region that had a similar industry mix. And the reason why this is important is if we notice that manufacturing was 17 percent, that's really high. I mean, we were just in Detroit last week giving a presentation, and it's, I think, 9 percent there with all the automotive. Um, but if we were to choose a peer where manufacturing was only 12 percent or 10 percent, then when we go into a recession, that pier is going to look a whole lot better than Evansville because manufacturing is so cyclical. Um, or even manufacturing is growing slower now. If we um, picked a pier where professional business services was a high percentage well, if relative to manufacturing, again, Evansville would look bad because um, professional business services is growing faster right now. So we wanted regions that were so similar enough that we can then look at some other underlying drivers of what is causing these other peers to grow faster or slower than Evansville. So how did we identify these um, peers? We started out with 381 MSAs, Metropolitan Statistical Areas, so every 10 years the government um, reconsiders um, what are the uh, geographic scope of those MSAs based on commuting patterns. And um, we're always trying to improve, so since we've done this project with Pete, we've gone in and um, 
created the ability now to pick, if you're in a rural area, to pick a rural county and it's contiguous or the, uh, the, the commuting pattern areas around it. So if we were to do this with a rural area, and we have since done it with some areas outside um, MSAs, then we have a lot more that we start out with. So we, in the second box, then we start to break it down because we only pick population with 25% above or below Evansville. So by doing that, um, we were down to 59 MSAs. So a lot dropped out there. And then we looked at the five um, broad categories that I talked about on the previous page. Demographic, economic, infrastructure, quality of place, and policy. Uh, we, we removed any state capitals because Evansville is not one. We removed land grant universities, and so our prelim preliminary list of peers was 20. So then we spent a lot of time with the stakeholders, um, Pete leading that up to get their assessment of um, thoughts on what those peers should be, and we went back and forth on some of our thoughts and their thoughts and ended up um, with the peers that are shown here. So we have Evansville in the middle there in orange. Uh, we've got uh, four aspirational peers, and the remaining are um, uh, just plain old uh, peers. And you can see it's all concentrated in the Midwest to South, and we purposely did that because in the West, the counties are so much larger, and it was felt that Evansville is more competitive with these counties and regions that we just uh, looked at here. That is competitive <coughs> in terms of trying to attract firms and growth. Any questions so far? Okay. Part of part of why we wanted to take that approach is that um, my board and, and others in the community, and we all see this, there's a listing that comes out of the 10 best cities to live in, the 10 worst cities to live in, and all of these best and worst lists that come out, and they want to know how, wh why are we not listed on this one, or why are we high on that one. We wanted to sort of take that out. I mean, that kind of comes and goes, and you know, a lot of it is agenda-driven sometimes. So we wanted to create some sort of a way that we could have a constant measurement of how are we doing against the cities that we consider our peers and consider our aspirationals and look at the things that are really important to, yeah. to us, the, the economic right. indicators. Yeah, and one other thing before I get your question, Avi. Some, so there are a lot of other groups out there that do rank every, all the MSAs in the country, and like the Milken Institute, but it does it only based on technology. So it depends on your goal right. in terms of you know, what are you trying to do um, will define how you're trying, what indicators you're using. Another, if you haven't seen the Chicago Federal Reserve ranks all, they say, it, they, they, it's a little bit misleading, they call it metropolitan areas, but it's really only a city. So it would be the city of Evansville or the city of Detroit, and that really doesn't take into account the broader area. Avery? It, it was that they were much larger in terms of population and their underlying growth rate was faster. So there were, looking at them, you already saw that they were not light years ahead, but currently on a different level than Evansville. Okay, um, so the economic indicators. Yeah, the, 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 there was one, and it was Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan. Uh, and um, probably about three years prior to the start of this project, um, and it was actually just before I joined, a group from the ERBC went up to visit Grand Rapids. There was tremendous growth happening up there. There was expansion of a, a building of a med school uh, in Grand Rapids, and it was really a whole revitalization process. So we knew that Grand Rapids, um, needed to be one of those uh, aspirational cities. I don't think there were, Chris. If I think, I think back, it's a good question. I, th there, there really weren't. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there were a number that we took. I think Rockford, Illinois was yeah. in there that we ended up taking out. Um, but we, we, we tried to really go back to the data again and eliminate sort of the gut feel uh, again my board is made up of primarily CEOs, right? And, you know, they get the data, but they also have feelings and beliefs, right? So we kept trying to take them back to, but here's what the data says. Um, and, and that's kind of how we landed 
where we yeah. did. And another thing on the aspirational, um, Avery, you asked, um, there was a sense of people knowing what the regions were like, and it was a region that they would like to be like, mm -hmm. um, even aside from what the data were showing. Okay, so here are the 32 indicators representing the four categories. So we did look at all these and we track all these, um, but it's not all part of the scorecard. So um, here I'm showing you all of the source, sources in the last column if you're interested in doing that yourself. M and many of those sources that we're saying census, it's actually in um, Jobs EQ as well in the demographics so that you can get them there. Then on the economic side, in fact, all the demographics are in Jobs EQ. The economic side, you can see mainly in Jobs EQ with the uh, um, airport employment is an interesting one. I think a good one to track, and that comes from the Federal um, Airline Administration or Airport or Aerospace Administration. Uh, how many people get on a plane per year? Yeah, and so for example, um, it, it, that one would, population would knock Orlando out, but clearly Evans, um, Evansville and Orlando Airport, they're nothing like each other. Um, so we wanted um, at least access to the community. There's no one here from um, Ithaca, New York, is there? Binghamton. Binghamton, okay. <laughs> well, you have a better airport. It's tough to fly in and out of Ithaca. Um, even worse than that is Texarkana. I mean, th the same lady, um, Annette, everyone knows Annette because she, she checks you in, she does your TSA, and she has the plane come in. <laughs> and as people walk out the plane, she's given half of them a hug. So, um, uh, anyway, Evansville is way beyond that, but not as big as Orlando. So that's, that's another important indicator. It, business attraction would be more difficult if you have just two flights going out a day. Um, okay, so we looked at patents from the U.S. Patent Office and then um, number of small businesses or percentage of small business from the Census County Business um, and then down below the National Center of Education Statistics is where we got a good bit of the human capital information, but it, that's in Jobs EQ as well. Um, early childhood education is in NCES, so that was um, a good one. Cost of living comes from C2ER. And then the county health rankings, if you haven't seen that uh, site, you should. There's a ton of data out there, um, not just on an overall health index, but you know, 20, 30, 40 different categories of smoking, obesity, and all kind of other things to identify um, health issues. So um, here's an example. Well, that's interesting. We have uh, four ghost bars at the end <laughs> that represent the um, aspirational peers. But here you can see Evansville, its growth rate since 2005 in terms of population growth indexed to the peer regions in blue and Evan, uh, aspirational peers in gray. And then you could see Evansville growth rate um, between 2005 and 16, relatively slow, 0.3, um, compared to some of the peers, but Davenport was um, a peer a little bit slower in terms of population growth. And then for the most part, the aspirational peer is growing faster uh, than um, the Evansville region. Now, focusing on the key indicators, so we have um, eight dashboard. Now, that now we're you know winnowing it down to not all 30 some indicators that we're tracking over time, but we've got eight dashboard indicators. And then here's where um, Pete's going to create his uh, his work stream groups to try to look at the drivers of these to try to grow them or decrease them in terms of poverty over time. And um, population, young adult population, the poverty rate, employment growth, average annual a wage. Education attainment, cost of living, which is sort of a sidebar. They're just trying to track that to make sure it's staying about the same in overall health index. So um, these we picked on these because these were those that were deemed to be most important or critical to success of the regional development. So um, some of these indicators that we looked at were overlapping with each other. And again, in discussions with um, the team and in other research that's out there, um, these were the ones that pointed to um, being the most critical. And again, we had to pick those that were from reliable data that was available across the country so we could track um, it for both the peer and the aspirational regions. So with that, let me hand it back to Pete so that he can show you 
the first scorecard or dashboard. Chris will answer any questions on data. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a dashboard that we put together. Um, if you look at the uh, vertical line, you can see that we've consolidated the peers and the aspirationals into an average so that we can just com compare that. So the red and green stoplight just shows us where we have some concerns or where we're doing better, right? So, um, and, and this is how we broke it down from the initial run of data that we, um, that we got from Chris and, and her team. And again, I'm not going to go line by line, but you can see, allows us to see how we're doing across those eight uh, categories um, by peers and by aspirationals that we have here. And I think this was really a, a tremendous asset as we got in front of the CEOs and, and the, the business leaders in the community and st uh, started to share this information in a, in a way that they could understand it and it wasn't so you know, onerous in terms of a big deck of data that we had. I, I think this was, um, you know, a bit of a money slide here as well. You know, th this slide sort of represents data that was collected at the end of 2018. It represents some different time frames with that, but it was what we called 2018 data. We went back and went all the way back to 2005 in some cases and wanted to see what the longer term trends were. And we, we think the trends are really what tell the story here. Our population growth was relatively flat compared to our peers and our aspirationals. Again, the Evansville region is orange, the peers are blue, and the uh, aspirationals are gray. Uh, if you go down, you can see you know poverty is a huge concern for us. And, and I think this sort of you know, hit them in the head with a hammer when, when they took a look at this over time, where the, the peers and the aspirationals are lowering poverty, our poverty levels continue to, to escalate. Uh, employment numbers, we're ticking slightly up, but clearly not as, not as uh, robust as our peers and our aspirationals. Um, and then average wages, um, you know, while are somewhat close to our peers, I mean, clearly in 2017, there appears to be a dip there that that, again, starts to tell the story of, of, you know, what we need to do and why we need to do it. And all of this is, is not being driven by gut feeling. It's being driven by what the data is telling us, which I think was critical. Uh, so from there, we decided, okay, we want to start to set some, some goals. And let me pause there for a second and say we, we've termed the project Talent 2025. But this is really a project that you could call Talent 30, Talent 35, Talent 40. 2025 is a point in time that we felt within a five-year window, we want to be able to show progress. And again, as I go back and say, this initiative is really being led by the business community, by the, C by the CEOs in the region or the business heads in the region. Um, for those of you who've worked with business heads, you know they're not very patient people. And if you try to sell an initiative that's not going to show benefits for 10, 15, 20 years, they start to zone out on you. And, and, and I've worked in the office of a CEO for 20 years, 25 years, and, and I, I know. So we decided to coin this project Talent 2025 because by, 2020, 20, by 2025, we want to be able to show significant progress against the goals that we have set here. And, and again, I'm not going to cover each one, but, but you, can, you can glance at that and see, um, see what our goals for 2025 are. Yeah. If I could just make yep, one absolutely. statement on that. So on this, we helped them to make sure that these goals were doable or they, they were not too much of a stretch. So for example, on the population growth, um, Indiana as a state had goals that it pushed down to everyone when we first came to them. And it was based on historical trends. They did not take into account the fact that growth in the whole U.S. population was slowing. So um, we took that into account in the population growth numbers. And then also on the increase in wage side, we looked at their industry mix and the expected growth, given that what um, increase should we expect to see in wages, and also made sure that we weren't just letting them get off with the, you know, the CPI increase that occurs every year. So we uh, worked with them on those.
Right. So we took inf inflation, and we assumed, I think, something like 2% inflation to make sure that we weren't just um, giving them too easy of a time on that, as in they didn't even need to bring in higher um, wage jobs, that they would just get there um, with momentum. You know, and, and, and staying on the wage one, I mean, that one caused a little bit of tension within my organization, the ERBC. The CEOs are saying, wait a minute, you're telling me I need to increase the wages of my employees by $10,000 by 2025? No. What, what it means is, from an economic development perspective, all jobs aren't created equal. Do we want to continue to try to strive to bring low-wage manufacturing jobs in? And I'm not saying that all manufacturing jobs are low-wage, but low-wage manufacturing or do we want to set the bar higher and try to, if we stay in manufacturing, look at you know, those that focus on AI and, and those higher paying type jobs that come into a, into a region. So that really just means all jobs aren't created equal. Yeah. Is it the fact that it's like a wage increase that that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think. Doesn't it, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's, it's just, that's just a placeholder. Uh, that's misleading. It's not through SNAP. It, it's just illustrative of that in there. Uh, and the goal of 2100 means 2100 people coming out of poverty, uh, the, the poverty status uh, in that regards. The, one of the things as we went through this process that became very evident to the core team, all of these are related in one way or the other. It's, it's like squeezing the balloon. You squeeze one here, it pops out here, right? The long, narrow clown balloon. And, and I think one of the, the great outcomes of this process, if you go back to the members of the core team, and I have a slide here in a second that will start to talk about the process that we use to start to get to this, is that these groups now have a very clear understanding of the interrelatedness that happens between what the United Way is trying to do and impact poverty, how that affects uh, employment growth, getting more people, you know, back into the workforce and, and addressing poverty. And so there's a, there's a lot of aha moments that we've gone through as a collective team as we've gone through this process that I think has brought that team to a much clearer understanding that all of this is interrelated. We, we can no longer just do these silos or we can no longer just do tactics without an, an interlocking strategy across those. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Any more questions on the data? Are there? So, and the next slide I, I think is, is one that really is illustrative of the point that Chris made is that we wanted to pressure test these numbers, right? And are, are they a pipe dream or what are we smoking or, or are they so low we're sandbagging it? You know, are, are they close? So we asked Chris and her team to take these numbers and plot them on, on the graph that you saw earlier. Um, so by 2025, 2025, too many 20s 20, in there. 20. By 2025, if we reach our goal for population growth, that's what happens to our trend line. If um, we reach our goal for poverty of taking 2,100 people out of poverty, that's what happens to our trend line by 2025. Same thing with annual wages, same thing with employment growth as well. So that gave us a pretty good indication that these goals were pretty close to being on target of what we wanted to try to accomplish here, which again goes back to the intent of 2025, which isn't to drive us to an ultimate number, but what it's intended to do is significantly change the trend lines of what we are seeing as a region. Now, what we don't know and what we can assume is that our peers and aspirations are going to sit back and do nothing as well, right? I think this is a classic case of they're going to be doing things. If we're not doing things, we're going to fall further behind the curve and, and we're not going to be able to keep up. Hopefully, uh, and again, we're going to talk about some of, the, some of the processes that we used here. Some of our thinking is breakthrough, innovative enough, and radical enough that we may catch lightning in a bottle and, and really spike and really make a big breakthrough across this. But um, we've got these trend lines for all of those factors um, on, the, uh, on the dashboard, the eight or nine items on the dashboard. This is just representative of four of them. But in all cases, all the goals that we set would significantly change the direction of our trend lines by 2025. 
which made us again feel that we were pretty, pretty close to being on target of what we wanted to try to get to. Okay, um, so how do we begin to move the data that we have, the alignment, into a process to begin to start to get us to, to strategies? So this goes back to, I think, sort of the value that, that I bring to this process. And again, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not an economic development person, but what I am good at, as I said, of getting people aligned behind a common vision and moving them along. Um, so, um, a lot of what you've seen up to this point, uh, and continually, you know, to this, to this day, has sort of happened below the hor horizon. This isn't a open the kimono, full Monty out to the region to show everyone what we're working on and what we're happening and what's happening. Um, this is, we want to ensure the data is solid. We want to assure our assumptions are correct. We want to be able to tell our story and who we have engaged and, w and the groups that we have engaged has been in a very strategic manner. And what we've applied here and what you're gonna see in a second is we've applied a, if you will, a modified collective impact model to how we went about uh, doing this. So we established uh, five work streams and it goes back to the, to the core team. So the Chamber of Commerce for the region is owning population growth and young adult population. The Economic Development Coalition, which is focused on bringing new jobs into the, into the region, is focused on employment growth and wage growth. Um, the Growth Alliance for Greater Evansville, which again is the Greater um, Evansville uh, downtown area, is focused on improving uh, educational attainment levels. Uh, the Wellborn Baptist Foundation is focused on improving our overall health index and the United Way is focused on um, um, improving or, or lowering our poverty levels. Now, not to get lost in all of this is the word strategy down below. Strategy doesn't, doesn't reflect the strategies that we're developing, but it's the strategy that we've used with each of these work streams as we, as we go forward. The ERBC is the backbone to all of this. So we're, we're the ones who provided the funding to bring Chris and her team on board um, and, and other work that we had to do to continue to move this down the, down the path. So first step is what, we, what, we, what each work stream did is assembled high uh, leverage regional uh, teams. And I think all of you will appreciate this, trying to do strategic work with a group of 20 to 25 people just doesn't work. So the work streams that we created were intentionally designed to be anywhere from five to seven, six to eight people. And, and those were the high leverage people that we talked about. People that we knew were strategic thinkers, people that we knew had high credibility across the region. And to ensure that it just wasn't more of the same thinking, we required that each group have at least one, what we call a disruptor built into it. Someone who would think differently, someone who would challenge the group to think significantly different as we, uh, as they form, ultimately form the path, of going down the path of their strategy. So first step in that process for those work streams were to assemble a team that was high, what we call high leverage. Um, we have gotten some pushback. Some people in the community want to know, why am I not on this team? Well, well, you know, why wasn't I asked to be on the team? There's going to be a time and place for everyone in this process, but right now we selected people. These work streams were selected um, based upon, uh, again, uh, an organization's or an individual's ability uh, to think strategically. So the second step is Chris uh, provided each work stream with a comprehensive report of all the data that we had. And we said, okay, here's the data for your work stream that is part of the work that Chris and her team has done. W what else do you need? And I think all of the work streams came back to you, Chris, mm -hmm, right, right, and asked for additional data mm -hmm. for, for their work stream. And this is, again, to ensure that they're working off of the right data and have the right information in, in front of them. Um, so each work stream, collected additional data to help inform them. 
And, and Pete, if there's yep. one, one other thing I think you left out is that one of the banks, and I can't remember his name, provided an executive to sit in on each work stream to make sure that if there was overlap, it was getting up to Pete yeah. for him to know. What's not reflected on this, and, and this was my mistake on the slide, um, while each work stream, yes, is sort of working uh, vertically, there's a horizontal integration piece to all of this. So as Chris mentioned, we've got a, um, we've got a, a senior loaned executive from one of the organizations that sits in every time a work stream has a meeting, he sits in on that work stream. And if the employment growth is talking about something relative that the population growth is, needs to know about, he's ensuring that that dialogue is being shared and, and those uh, horizontal uh, discussions are taking place as well, which I think is critically important to the overall success here as well. Um, so with all the data in hand, we felt it was also, look, we're not the first community that's trying to address this. What we wanted to do is go out and steal from wherever we could on ideas. So we, we retained a firm to help us with the collection of best practice models from around the country. Uh, and this wasn't, a, uh, this wasn't a Google search of you know, best practices in lowering poverty rates. Uh, we retained a firm that, that went out and is familiar with um, community development, if you will, and, and go out and interview, you know, come back to us with a list of who you think are relevant and then actually interview these, these, uh, these uh, uh, communities or these cities or these regions that have um, uh, done this and, and, and uh, been successful with it. So they came back, now they're armed with the data, now they're armed with best practices. Um, their task right now is to start to work on what we call actionable and timely strategies. That can be executed over the next five years, hence uh, the 25. Um, the goal, and I'm gonna show you a timeline on the next slide, the goal and the outcome here is each work stream is to have three to four strategies that are finalized by the end of the year that can begin to be implemented and executed uh, beginning in the first quarter of uh, 2020. Um, Yeah, that, that's a great point. So, while each work stream has, um, I'll just say seven people that are, that are part of it, um, as we're thinking through the rollout of this, um, as I said, we, we've been sort of developing this below the horizon. As we bring this above the horizon in the first quarter, we have to, have to tell the story, sell this to the region, but we also have to help organizations find their place in this so that they don't feel alienated, they don't feel like they're not a part of this. I think the only way this works is if the, the, the regional organizations, whether it be a for-profit, not-for-profit, can find their place in what we're trying to do here. Now, being a realist, I think what this will drive us as a region to is one, one of three things. We, it'll help us identify what we need to continue to do, what's working, what we need to continue to do, maybe what we need to start to do uh, that we're not doing across all of those work streams, but maybe most importantly, and probably the toughest thing to do, what do we need to stop doing? Y you know, and, and there's, there's so many organizations that are helping trying to address poverty. Are they all really moving the needle or are there, you know, can some of them be consolidated? Should some of them go away and just focus on those that really we think have the opportunity to try to impact what we're trying to do here? So there is a socialization process, a rollout process that we're working on right now um, to help us roll this out to the community, to the region in a bigger, bigger, broader, broader way. As I said, this is work in progress. We're not there yet. Um, but what we don't want to do is get to, I'll just go to the next slide, we don't want to get to January when my board approves these strategies. They look to me and they say, okay, now what? And we say, well, we, we got to start on a rollout plan. No, not really. We've got another subgroup that's not reflected here that's starting discussions on what does a rollout plan need to look like so that when we get final strategies and mid to late January, we also have a rollout plan to be able to, to go with that strategy. 
I show this slide because I think it's important, um, the, the discipline that's been involved in this process. And we couldn't have these work streams working without a real structure behind it. As I said, if you look at the process that each work stream was driven to, each, pro each work stream is following those five steps within it. The other thing that each work stream is doing is that they're following this very specific timeline. So they all get to the end of the year and are all gonna have the same outcomes ready to, ready to discuss. We held a, and we actually began this project well before April, almost a year earlier, we were working with Chris and the team to collect the data. We brought all the work streams together in, um, on April 30th and we had the kickoff meeting where all five work streams were, were together. Um, they began in the, in the May-June time period to begin to look at the data and have some thoughts around what communities, what regions would be best practices. Um, June, July time period, again, continued to evolve both of those. Um, their first cut at, a str at strategic alternatives was in the August time frame, where each group presented, I think it was anywhere from eight to 10 strategies. W what are beginning thoughts on what strategies look like? Um, then we brought all the work streams back together in late September and had a meeting to say each work stream talked about what, what was the key data they collected, what were the key insights that they had, and what were their list of strategic alternatives. And each work stream got to have a discussion and provide input into what the other groups were, uh, were doing. Their charge now coming out of that meeting is uh, between uh, that meeting and where we are now in November, begin to narrow their strategic alternatives down have final language, proposed language in December, and then they come back to my board in uh, early January to start to um, uh, present what those, what those three or four key strategies are uh, going forward. Um, so that's the very specific process that we used in getting us to where, where we are at this point right now. Um, Chris, anything to add that I left out at this point? No, is there any clues that you can give us of what the strategies are? Some of the big strategies? Um, you know, I, I don't want to squeeze any toothpaste out of the tube okay. on that one yet, because uh, <laughs> some of them I think are looking real good, others need a little bit of work left, uh, left on them. But I, I, I will share final slide here, conclusions. Um, you know, I, I think what this process has helped us do, it's really helped us to understand where our region is and where we stand relative to our peers, and really identified, I think, the areas that we really need to focus on. So again, that got us to those eight indicators that you saw on that dashboard um, measurement. Um, I alluded to the fact already, I think the, the, the core members of the team really have a much better appreciation for the interrelatedness of what those organizations do and, and how they're doing it. I will also say that each of those organizations um, signed on to, uh, again, I'll, I'll just use the United Way. The United Way has agreed to make poverty a major component of their strategic plan within their organization going forward as well. P obviously poverty isn't the only issue the United Way is going to address, but they've agreed to make poverty and addressing the issues behind poverty as one of their major strategic planks. Just as the Chamber of Commerce has done the same thing under population growth. Population growth is going to be a major factor, a major strategy within their work plan for the next five years and so on. So uh, I think it's brought those five groups together in a much more cohesive, much more collaborative uh, way uh, than what's existed in the past. And I think the teams are armed with the data and the resources. They're working on the strategies right now uh, and along with the rollout plan that we're working on. And, and you know, if, if all things, or I should say when all things come together, uh, maybe next year we can come back and present what those strategies were and what mm -hmm. the rollout begins to look like and, and how it's going. So um, that's where we are. Great. So. Looks like we have five minutes if there are any questions. Mm. Uh, I, I actually, uh, annually. So, so we're, we're collecting data on those 32 metrics that Chris shared. Yeah. 
on, on an annual basis. We're collecting data. The question was, will oh. you change those peer readers? Oh, regions? will we change them? I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood you. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we want to be so rigid that if something, you know, something pops up that we, I mean, I, I think, I think the, the core of the regions will probably stay the same, but if something pops up where we say, you know, we really need to drop this one or add this one, or, or I, I think we're going to be open enough to, yeah. to and, do and that. And again, many of the indicators choosing the pier don't change much, like capital, on the ocean, uh, employment, although that could change if the region starts to grow mm -hmm. faster. And I'd be glad to answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Good question. I, I was going to come back to that. So um, I mentioned that this is being business driven. It's not being government driven. Um, that's not to exclude government from being aware of the process of that we're doing and keeping them aware of that process. I mentioned that we had visited Grand Rapids. We had visited uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and we had visited Omaha, Nebraska. And the loud and clear from those three regions said, change has been led by business and government follows. So we, we kind of took that to heart, um, you know, given the fact that they're on our um, uh, aspirational list, um, that we wanted to um, have this being driven by business, which I think puts a higher level of uh, potential priority on the work. Uh, I think it accelerates the timeline, given that, again, we're used to, CEOs are used to, you know, moving things through in a pretty rapid pace as compared sometimes, as we all know, government can be a little slow in, in making change happen. So it isn't that we're excluding government, we're keeping them aware, but we just don't have them sitting on any of the strategic teams that are, that are formed. Um, we're, we're keeping the mayor, we're keeping the counties, uh, abreast of what's happening. Um, you know, some of them don't like it that they're not involved, but, but they'll get over it.